chapter 17 tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 17. So um, last time we left off at the end of chapter 16 with David uh, going to work for Saul and uh, uh, becoming a, a minstrel for him and ultimately his armor bearer. Um, and I, I'm thinking that that's down the road a little bit. I'm thinking that's not immediately. And I'll show you why in just a second. But uh, Saul could have had more than one armor bearer. But I, I doubt it at a time. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Now you've got to remember, the Philistines are, are really oppressing Israel at this point in time. There's no smiths in Israel. They have to go to the Philistines to sharpen their plow points and things like that. Uh, and so the Philistines are encroaching upon them. They we're not in Philistine territory. We're in Judah. And you could go to the Valley of Elah today, and it's very pretty. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice valley in the midst of, it's going to call it mountains, or, but, but I'm going to call them hills. Um, they, it's, it's not real, real high mountains, but it's a really pretty valley. And today they farm it. Uh, it's, it's cultivated, it's irrigated, and uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. And so it says there that Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah. And they set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And uh, think about the hill country of Texas, more so than, uh, than mountains like the Rockies. So... That's, that's more what, what you should picture in your mind as you see them standing on these mountains. So it's not, uh, it's kind of like Oklahoma, you know. Uh, we're stuck here in these, that old country music song says we're stuck here in these hills that they call mountains. Uh, there are no mountains in Oklahoma. There are some hills, uh, but uh, then you go someplace like Montana and you realize, oh, these are mountains. So anyway, it says there they went out uh, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Now Gath is a Philistine city, one of the five major ones. And uh, his height was six cubits and a span. So a cubit is measured from here to here, approximately. And of course, if we were to all line up, all, the, uh, all of us here today and measure our cubit. Uh, matter of fact, let's just do it. Julia, come here. Let's, let's do a cubit measurement. Let's see. Let's see what your cubit looks like. Hold your arm up. So Julia's cubit is a little bit different than mine. Okay, D, come here. <clears throat> Let's see what David's cubit looks like. Not cubert. That's an old video game. That's pretty close. That's pretty close. Okay. We're going to say a cubit is 18 inches. Now, it... As you study this, everybody, this is a big argument, a big fuss. And well, was it a Hebrew cubit? Was it a, uh, a Hittite cubit? Was it this? Was it that? Let's call a cubit 18 inches, okay? And it says he was six cubits in a span. So a span is from here to here. And it's kind of interesting how God designed your body. If you do that, a cubit is made up of two spans. So if a cubit's 18 inches, how long is a span? About nine inches, right? Isn't that interesting? Did you ever, you ever know? Did you, you ever measure your nose with your joints of your finger and your ears and where they're placed? You know, you you got symmetry to your body. And so, this was this was an ancient measuring. Now, this is a hand breadth. This is a span. So he's six cubits in a span. So that's six times eighteen plus nine, or nine foot nine inches tall. And maybe bigger than that, because if a cubit's 20 inches, well, then he's even bigger than that. Nine, nine, let's call him, okay? So, this is not just a big basketball player in their day. This is a giant. This is, and we've read about these, you know, as we studied the book of Deuteronomy, we saw that there was Og, and there were other giants in the land, lots of them. When the, the Israelite spies went into the land, they encountered the sons of the Anakim, they said. And some people say, well, they were just saying that. They were whining because they were afraid of the people. But I don't think so. I think there's lots and lots and lots of biblical evidence 
that there were giants. And there were giants before the flood, Genesis tells us. The flood came and wiped them all out. Starts over again with Noah's family. And then we wind up with giants after the flood. And that's where Goliath comes from. Okay? So how did that happen? Well, whatever caused the giants before the flood had to have happened at least to some degree after the flood for there to be more giants on the land. Either that or there was some giant DNA in one of Noah's son's wives, one or the other. And I'm thinking that we had more angelic activity after the flood. Nonetheless, here he comes, nine foot nine. He had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. We're going to call that about 125 pounds. How'd you like to wear a 125 pound shirt? That would, I would, that would make for a long day, wouldn't it? And uh, he had greaves of brass upon his legs. Those are his, his leg protectors. And a target of brass between his shoulders. That's his, his back uh, <clears throat> shield or piece of armor. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And so if you were to, to think about a, a, a weaver setting up a big loom, it was like the, the top beam of that. And uh, I don't know what that would weigh, but it's a chunk of really hard wood. And uh, it says, And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. That's about 15 pounds. So just the head of the spear, not counting the weaver's beam-like shaft, weighed 15 pounds. What's a shot put weigh? Anybody throw the shot? Anybody know what a shot weighs? Ten? Six pounds for the mini shot. So... So let's think about a spear with a shot on the end of it. Pretty close. Something like that, right? I couldn't even pick it up, much less throw it. And if I did throw it, it'd get from, you know, about here to that basketball goal or something. It'd be, uh! And so, but this is, this is normal for him. He's a big guy. And he stood and he cried unto the armies of Israel. And he said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and you servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And so I'm thinking Goliath has done this before. Um, he's a big bully, and he's, he's defying their army. He's making fun of them. He's mocking Saul. And so it tells us there in verse 12, Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, Next unto him, Abinadab, and the third, Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But, verse 15, says, David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So Saul had previously needed somebody to play the harp for him. So they had suggested David. He had sent for him. He had come. He had spent time with Saul. He had played the harp for him. But now he has returned home for whatever reason. I don't know why. Maybe it's because the other boys went off to battle. Uh, I, I'm not sure. But for whatever reason, he goes home. And it says there, uh, verse 16, the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And it, isn't it interesting? Same length of time as the flood. Same length of years as the wilderness wandering. Same length of time as the spies in the land of Canaan. It's a it's a, a biblical time of testing, and so the people are in this time of testing. For 40 days, they sit here. Every morning, they get up. They go line up in their battle array. Goliath comes down and mocks them, hollers at them, yells at them. Nobody goes out to face him, so he turns around and goes back, and they all go back to camp, and nobody is willing to take this on. Now, who's the biggest guy in Israel? Saul, the king. But you're not going to send your king to go and fight the giant, are you? Or maybe your king's not willing to go and fight the giant, apparently. And so 
So you've, you've just got this stalemate for 40 days, it says. And uh, it says there in verse 17, And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves. Run to the camp to thy brethren. Carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. And look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. So go check on them. Send some food. See how the battle is going. And Jesse's interested in the battle because the battle's right over there, right? I mean, they've invaded Judah at this point. So, so Jesse, he needs to know what's going on and what the state is because he might have to evacuate. Now Saul and they and all... Oh, by the way, remember, part of David's reputation at this point in time is that he is a mighty man of war. Even as a young man, even as the youngest of the brethren, he already has this kind of reputation, okay? And so... Uh, it says that uh, uh, now Saul and they, verse 19, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep of the keeper, took and went as Jesse had commanded him, and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. So every morning they shout for the battle, right? They get all stirred up and pumped up and hoorah, you know, and high five each other and chest bump each other and then go out there and shaking their boots because, you know, I think, I think maybe in a full-fledged fight, they would have been willing to, to take on the Philistines. But in a one-on-one -on -one with Goliath, they don't have anybody that's, that's going to go for it. So it says there in verse 21, For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men, I wonder how close they were. When they set up in array, you know, it says, it says at the beginning they were on these two mountains, but now it says that the men fled from him. I wonder if Goliath actually approached to the armies or exactly how he did it. I wonder if he went up there and went like that at them, and they all fell back. I mean, they're scared to death of this guy. And physically, humanly, fleshly speaking, rightly so. But you see, what we're fixing to see is, is this, this difference in viewpoints. And, and this is the way we're all supposed to live our lives. So from here on out, this is where our real lesson comes in tonight. You've got... You've got all of Israel, and they represent the, the logical, fleshly, worldly, human approach to life and situations. And you've got this giant that represents, well, evil, uh, the enemy, right? And their logical human reaction to him is fear and avoidance, <clears throat> But when David shows up, his reaction is completely different than everybody else's there. That's the way you're supposed to be in the world. That's the way I'm supposed to be in the world. We are not supposed to look at the things that happen in this life the same way that the rest of the world does. We're not supposed to look at the enemy the same way. We're not supposed to look at evil the same way. And we're not supposed to react like the world does. And so... Uh, David hears him and what he says. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that's come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And I might just tackle the giant for the no taxes, right? That'd be worth quite a bit. I mean... So, so anyway, Saul has already given all kinds of incentive to the army to get somebody. I'll give you my daughter to be your wife. I'll make you free in Israel. You won't have to pay taxes forever in Israel, right? And so here's the, here's the first thing that we learn about David, that David is different from everybody else. Number one, David is fearless because he knows God. David is fearless because he knows God. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine 
that he should defy the armies of the living God. Look at the difference in the approach. The rest of the men, they flee from the giant. David says, who does he think he is? How can anybody defy God's armies? I mean, to David, this is unthinkable, right? We cannot lose. Now think about it. David's going back. He's thinking about Joshua. He's thinking about the promises made of the, of the, 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 to the children of Israel about this land. He's sitting here looking at them. These people are in the land of Judah. This land was given to us by God. This is part of my family's inheritance. This is my tribe's inheritance. That guy can't do what he's doing. Who does he think he is? Right? I love it. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And now, here comes, here comes Big Brother. Now, this is, this is really interesting to me. And one of the things I want to remind you of is, is that Jesus' brothers, now he's the oldest, but his half-brothers, James and Judas and Simeon and his sisters, they deal with him sort of in the same manner. They kind of mock him at one of the feasts. Why don't you go up to the feast and reveal yourself to the world? Remember that from the book of John as we studied it? And so, so we learn that, that Jesus' brothers, half-brothers, on his mother's side, did not believe in him until after the resurrection. Okay? So during Jesus' earthly ministry, his brothers and his sisters, they... I guess, thought that he was about half crazy, about like they kind of treated him sort of the way that the Philistines did and maybe were a little bit embarrassed of him. So here's the three boys that have gone off to, to fight the oldest brothers, right? And I don't know about you, but I didn't have an older brother. I am the older brother. And I have a younger sister. But I had some friends that had younger brothers and I used to always get mad at them because every one of them was the same. They were all mean to their little brother. All of them. Every one of my friends that had a little brother. And I would come over and some buddies would come over and they'd be like, you can't play with us. I'm like, why not? I like your little brother maybe even better than I like you. <laughs> and uh, they would be like, no, you can't, you can't play with us because you're the little brother. And uh, I, never did, I never did appreciate that. But for some reason, for some reason, this kind of stuff happens in families. And Eliab and, and uh, the older brothers, they kind of look down on David. But remember, they were all standing right there that day that Samuel dumped that horn of oil over David's head. And that had to have just, just bugged him to no end. Don't you know? I mean, Jesse didn't even invite David to the party. And here's big strapping Eliab, right? He's a man among men. Jesse's a man among men. Nope, nope, not him. Nope, not you. Nope, nope, nope. Is this all you got? Oh, the little one. Yeah, with the sheep. Well, go get him. Bring him in here. He's the one. And all those boys just had to be sitting there going, you got to be kidding me. Think about Joseph's older brothers. Oh, Joseph sitting there eating his post toasties one morning. Hey, guys, did you hear about the dream I had last night? Yeah, dad and mom bowed down to me and all you guys were serving me. And they're like, yeah, let's get rid of this dreamer, right? And so, so that's kind of where David is with his family. So Eliab, his eldest brother, verse 28, heard what he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Isn't that amazing? He's talking to his king. He doesn't know it yet. Or he hasn't accepted it yet. But he saw him anointed by the, the prophet. But because he's the little brother, there's this familiarity of family that's bred contempt here. And he calls him naughty and prideful. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? I love it. David's like, what, are, what, did, I do? what did I do to you, Eliab? Get out of the way. And so he goes on. He turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. The people answered him again after the former manner. You see, what, what David is doing is, is he is, I think, I think he is expressing his utter amazement. That everybody else is treating this situation. He cannot believe they've sit here for 40 days and let that loud mouth do what he's been doing. I cannot believe it. So he's, he's trying to figure, am I missing something here? What am I missing here? 
And so he asks again, now what's going to happen to the guy that goes and kills this guy? Because in David's mind, it's as good as done. Right, this ain't no big deal. This is light work right here. <laughs> you got to love it. You just got to love it. By the way, this is part of the reason why he's the king. Because this is what it looks like to be a man after God's own heart. It means to be fearless because you trust in God, right? So he says, verse 30, he turned from him toward uh, another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And so once again, David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. I just love it. I love it. Here's the kid who plays the harp for me, right? You're the kid, you're the, you're the kid who can play the harp, right? Yes, sir. But don't worry. Don't let anybody's heart fail. I'll fight him. And, and Saul, at this point, this is, this is when a king says, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. Who would have ever think of such a thing? But I think Saul is, is a bit taken back. And so he's going to ask a question. And that question is going gonna, is gonna to bring us to another thing about David. First of all, he's fearless uh, in the face of the enemy. But, but secondly, verse 33, Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Now, a few weeks back, we talked about uh, if you're a young person and you want to be treated um, with respect, then you need to... You need to act with respect. You need, to, you need to be an example of what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Well, this is a great study in what that looks like. So Saul actually asked the question. This guy is a trained warrior. You are a youth. You're, you're, you're a very young man. What makes you think that you can go and fight him? Okay? Now this is great. Because this is where David puts his, he is trusting in the faithfulness of God. So first of all, he's fearless because he trusts God. But secondly, he's trusting in the faithfulness of God because David has a track record with God. So he says here, David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. This is the question. How do you think you can go up against a giant who's a trained warrior? David says, here's how. He said, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. Um, I have seen from here to those things right there, a half-grown lion, and from here to that basketball goal, seven full-grown lions. And I'm here to tell you, uh, on my best day, I don't want to wrestle with that beast. Incredible beast. Can jump halfway across this room, maybe farther than that if he wants to, uh, take a, a full-grown Cape Buffalo on uh, and probably get the better of him eventually. Uh, it, incredible beast. Not only that, but a bear. You say, well, what kind of a bear would there be in Israel? Well, I don't know. Several, about 3,000 years ago, but uh, even a little bear that got claws about that long, I wouldn't want no part of him. But David said, these two animals came. I'm tending my father's sheep. These animals come. They come to take these sheep. He says, <clears throat> they took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him. And I smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Caught him by his beard. He's hand-to-hand he's -hand combat with a lion and with a bear. And then he says, thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God hot dog man I love it I love it because this is this is David having a track record with God you see David's looking back this is David's Ebenezer moment is what this is you remember when, when Samuel set up the stone and he said, he said, hitherto hath the Lord helped us? Well, that's exactly what David is doing right here. He says, I have never been let down by my God, ever. 
My God is faithful. My God has given us promises to Israel over this land. My God has given us promises against these enemies. My God has, I have a proven track record with God in my past. And it came out of my everyday life. No, I've never personally fought a giant. But I've fought a bear and I've fought a lion. And if God can give me victory over them, God can give me victory over this giant. And that's how you learn to live your life. You, you, you go from victory to victory to victory to victory. And when you come up against the new enemy, the new giant, the new situation, you look back and you say, has God ever helped me in the past? Has God ever answered a prayer in the past? Has God ever got me through a situation in the past? One, one time... <laughs> I, I don't tell this story to, well, I just tell the story because I think it's funny. Uh, <clears throat> a long time ago, I interviewed with a particular church. And uh, I was, I was uh, it was right, not, lo not long before we moved down here. And I knew that God was moving us. I knew that something was going on. I wasn't sure exactly what. And a friend of mine called and said, hey, our church is looking for a pastor. And I've thrown your name in the hat. And the pulpit committee wants to, to meet with you. And so Wendy and I drove to, drove, 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 drove to another city and uh, we uh, uh, met with, I met with this, this pulpit committee. And uh, this was, this was a, a big church in a big city um, and I was totally unqualified for what they wanted. They wanted a seminary guy, they wanted a guy with lots of experience, they wanted, you know, yada, 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 all this. I think they wanted a guy who would put a tie on and that was a deal breaker. Anyway, so, so we're, we're having this meeting and, and we're talking and they're asking me questions and I'm answering and I'm asking them questions. And, and uh, so anyway, one of the guys, he just grins and he looks at me and he says, he says, you know, he says, you pastor, what size is the church? And it's always the same. It's always the same. It never, it never, it, it always blows my mind. How big is your church? I, if you get around a group of preachers, that's the question that's going to be asked every single solitary time. And for some reason, pastors of bigger churches are more important than pastors of little churches. So whatever. So I just grin. Now, how big is the church? And I know exactly where he's going with this. How big is the church that you pastor? I said, well, when we had Kevin Kirkland and God's Eye come, we had 112 in Sunday school that day and we knocked her in the head. It ain't never been that, many, that big again, you know. 112 in Sunday school. It's the biggest day we ever had. I said, ah, you know, you most of the time we got about 65, 45 to 65 in Sunday school. 100 is just, and, and what makes you think, and he's just kind of grinning, you know, what makes you think that you coming from a church of, let's say 75, could pastor a church the size of this, six, seven hundred? I just looked at him and I smiled and I said, once when I was tending my father's sheep, there came a lion and there came a bear. And those guys ate it up, man. They just loved it. They, they were like, you know, we're never going to call you, but that's the best answer we've ever heard in our life. And I'm like, well, because it's the only answer that there is. It's the only answer that there is. The only answer that there is. How do you learn to trust Jesus right where you are? right in your family, right with your brothers and sisters, right with your mom and dad, right in the circumstances of your life, in your school, in your home, in your work, in your, in your neighborhood, in your circumstances. That's how you learn to trust God. David learned to worship God tending sheep. David learned to trust God protecting sheep. David learned to, to, to fight and to be a warrior taking care of his father's sheep. And that's how you learn to trust God too. In the day in and the day out, and you build a track record with God. And what you do is, is you prove God's faithfulness to you every day. And he's going to test your faith as you go. But you're going to prove God's faithfulness. Listen, you know what David didn't say is he didn't say, well, I've been a good boy and because of my righteousness, I know that my God is going to protect me. He didn't say that at all. Matter of fact, David didn't brag about his abilities. He didn't, he didn't even start to do that. Matter of fact, we're going to see that come next. It's all about God. Who is this that defies the living God? Who is this that defies the armies of the living God? 
I have a track record with God. God delivered me from the paw of the lion. God delivered me from the, the, the bear. God will deliver me from this Philistine. He says, verse 37, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. <laughs> what do you say to that, right? Saul's like, good grief. You're the only one who's willing. I don't think that Saul was in on the whole, if your guy beats our guy, we're going to be your servants forever. But what has he got to lose? Because they're already the Philistine servants, right? So he, he, he doesn't even argue. Go. And Saul armed David. Now here's, here's what's going to happen. Here's where we're going to see Saul still with his thinking of the logical, fleshly, human way of thinking. Well, we got to get you ready for battle. So he put a helmet of brass upon his head. He uh, uh, also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. You see, David has no track record with Saul's armor. By the way, David's a young man. Saul's a big man. So this armor doesn't fit very good. You know, don't, don't, don't ever go into battle with untested armor. Ever. You, you, you go into battle with what you have, with what you've tested. But, but don't ever think that, you know, the armor isn't what's going to give him the victory. It's going to be God that gives him the victory. And so David, he puts it all on, and I'm sure it was comical. I'm sure the, the sleeves hung past the ends of his fingers. I'm sure the belt was too big. I'm sure the sword drug the ground and the helmet fell down over his head about halfway. And he's like, ah, uh, now nah, this isn't going to work. So he sheds all of this. And it says there, he says, verse 40, he took his staff in his hand and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. And he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So why does he do this? Well, once again, what does David know? David knows how to use a sling. Now, don't ever downplay the sling. The sling was probably more deadly than a bow and arrow in their day. They could throw faster and farther. And uh, they, they say that people in that day and time... Uh, were accurate sometimes to as much as 300 yards with a sling. And also don't think about a slingshot, but we're talking about a big sling, and we're talking about a rock the size of an egg, maybe a goose egg, maybe bigger than that. So you get hit with that. Uh, I've got some uncles that spent a lot of time tending sheep. They were all really good with a sling. And my dad said that uh, he saw them knock all the windows out of the guard booth. <laughs> At the, at the air base across the, across the highway from where they lived, they would stand behind the edge of the building and get them a rock and they'd step out there and the guards were standing guard at the guard booth at the gate to Walker Air Force Base and they would knock the windows out of that and uh, the guards would hit the deck, you know, and then they'd look around who was shelling them and they'd stand behind the barn for a little bit and then they'd step out there and <laughs> knock the windows out of the... Said they had an old bull one day that was on the hook and he was really bad to fight and my great uncle Roddy took a rock about the size of a goose egg and broke his leg and then killed this bull weighed close to a ton with a couple of rocks and uh, so so don't don't ever think don't what whatever you do don't don't think about a little pebble I want you to think about a stone right I want you to think about an eight pound sledgehammer maybe not eight pounds but maybe a three-pound sledgehammer that he's going to hit Goliath right between the eyes with, with this, okay? So it says he chose five smooth stones. Why did he choose five? Why five? Maybe they were so big that's all they could fit in his, in his shepherd's bag. But I think the reason is found in 2 Samuel chapter 21 and verse 15. It says there, this is later in David's ministry. <clears throat> it says... Uh, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. So David's getting older, and, and he, he's, he gets tired in the battle. And Ishbi Bonoth, which was of the sons of the giant. Oh, we got more of these guys. So I don't know if these are the sons of Goliath's daddy, maybe, or if they're his sons. I'm not sure. So they're either his brothers or his sons. He says, uh, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. That's only half the size 
of Goliath's, by the way. He being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David, but Abishai, the son of Zariah, secured him, smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Shibi, Shib, Shibi, Shibbikai, the Hushathite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. There's two. And there was a giant a battle in the, uh, there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jari or Egim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There's three. And there was yet a battle in Gath, and there was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he was also, do y'all, when your baby's born, you count their fingers and toes? First thing I did. I wonder if we have any giant DNA in us. One, two, three, four, five. It's like, whew, thank you, Jesus. Anyway, he had six fingers and toes, four and twenty in number, and he was also born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, Shemia, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born of the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. So his cousins, his brother, and his men kill all five of these giants. So why did he choose five smooth stones? Was he afraid he'd miss? Nah, he had one for Goliath and four for the other giants that were either standing right there with him that day or that he knew existed. And so it says he picked these out of the brook. He put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in his scrip, and his sling was in his hand. He drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. So here is this giant fully armored with all of his armor and his armor bearer with his shield. And here's this boy, young man, with no armor, with nothing but a sling. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest at me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now remember, every, everything, every time he's hollered at the rest of the Israelites, they have, they have fallen back in fear. They're scared to death of him. But David's advancing. <laughs> Once again, it's, a, it's the total difference between the way that the natural man views things to be afraid of the enemy, to go away from the enemy versus the man of God who says, who does he think he is? I'll go and fight him. I'll use the weapons and tools that I know how to use and I'll trust in God. And so while everybody else is scooting back, David's advancing forward. And he says, the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air. And to the beasts of the field. Now here's the third thing. First of all, David is, David is fearless because of his faith in God. Number two, David is, has a proven track record with the faithfulness of God. He knows God to be faithful because he's seen God at work in his life in the past. Number three, David is focused on his faith in God. So while the Philistine is cursing David by his gods... Verse 45 says, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. God told Abraham, Abraham, I am your reward. God tells us, I am your shield. I am your rock. I am your buckler. I am the defense about you. Satan told Job. He said, I can't, or he told God, I can't get to Job because you've built a hedge around him. You see, David says, God is my shield. And so he is focused on his faith in God. And number four, David fought for the glory of God. David did not fight for his own glory that day. He's going to fight for the glory of God. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee <laughs> and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. See for David this is just like the showdown with the prophets of Baal in the days of Elijah. That's what this is. It's a showdown but it's not between David and Goliath. It's between God and Goliath. 
And David is, he is totally focused on God and he's totally fighting for God's glory. And he says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. You know, you, you, don't, you don't have to, to count up all of your resources. Uh, one of the worst sins that David ever sinned was taking a census in the land. He, he, he's, he's so trusting in the faithfulness of God here. Later on, he's going to actually have Joab take account of all the soldiers just to see how big his army is. And Joab is going to beg him, please don't do this. Please don't do this. But because David is taking his eyes off of God later in life. But at this point, he is totally zeroed in and focused on God. You don't need all the resources. It doesn't take that. It's, it's not about the resources. It's not about the wealth. It's not about the tools. It's not about the weapons. It's about God. And, and David realizes that. So it says, It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. Isn't it interesting too? I find this fascinating. It tells us what Goliath's spearhead weighed. Right? 15 pounds. If you got hit with a 15 pound spear, it'd knock a hole in you about that big around, right? But it doesn't tell us what the rock weighed that David threw at him. Isn't that interesting? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You see, everything about this story is focusing on the fact that David is trusting in God rather than his own ability. David didn't say, I can sling a stone at a hair's breadth, right? He could, but he's not bragging about those kinds of things. He's bragging on his God, okay? And so it says, he runs at him, he took thence a stone, and he slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. Now, I love this. I, I was listening to, I am doing a little research for this, and I found this, this guy who's an archaeologist, and he was actually in the Valley of Elah and talking about the valley in this, this neat video I was watching. And the guy was great, but what's interesting is, is he said, now when David hit the Goliath, it, it stunned him. It didn't kill him, it stunned him. And you know, I just, I'm not going for that. If it sank into his forehead, I'm thinking we've got major, major, uh, what do you call it? Central nervous system damage. Plus, what's he got on his head covering his forehead? He's got a helmet, doesn't he? That would have, bong. Now, if it had, bong, then it might have, cooled him, right? Knocked him out. It knocked the giant out and he fell to his ground. But this one says that that stone sunk into his head through a brass helmet, right in the forehead, right between the eyes. It just shows you how accurate and how deadly this stone throw was. I think it killed him deader than a hammer whenever he hit him with it. But anyway, that's just me. Bible doesn't say, so, so we'll go with that. It says, it sunk, uh, it hit him in the forehead, the stone sunk into his forehead, he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. And so, so it's interesting how the Bible points that out. You know, uh, David didn't have a sword, he, he hit him with a stone. Therefore David ran and he stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him. And cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. So maybe he wasn't fully dead. Maybe he was still kicking. I don't know. But at this point, now he dead because David done cut his head off. I wonder what his head weighed. You know, it's interesting. I, I did a little work on his BMI. You know what Goliath's BMI was? I'm not, I'm not real sure. But let's say it was 30. If his BMI was 30, that means that Goliath weighs almost 580 pounds. He's a big boy. Now you start piling all of that, that armor on him. I mean, he's wearing a 125-pound shirt. The whole guy with all of his armor and his, his helmet and all that, I mean, he's over 600 pounds that hits the earth. Uh, I cut down a tree trunk the other day, and it shook my backyard. I don't know what it weighed, but a 600-pound guy hits the ground. I'm thinking, boom, right? And so David goes over there, and he pulls out this great big giant sword for a 9-foot-tall dude. So whop, and cuts his head off, and the Philistines go, oh, and it just sends a shock wave through 
the Philistines. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Away they go. And the men of Israel ran, and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. So he chased them all the way back to the Philistine cities. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. So he packs this nasty old gory head back to Jerusalem. Okay? And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? Now, he already knows this because he's already called to Jesse and asked him to send his son to minister to him. But remember now, the reason that Saul's asking this question is because Jesse don't have to pay no more taxes in Israel. And Saul has to arrange a wedding now between Jesse and him. So he's got to figure out who this guy is because he's going to have to do all this because he's made this, this promise. Abner said, as thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. This is the captain of the host. They just let this kid go out. I mean, that basically they're sitting there going, well, this isn't going to... This isn't going to go over very well. What do you think, king? No, I don't think it's going to go over very well. But what do we got to lose? We're already the servants of the Philistines. So here's what we'll do. After he makes mincemeat out of this poor kid, then, you know, we'll have to see if maybe we can't best him in a, in a hand-to-hand fight, right? So Abner, he's getting everything ready. And I think the shock wave that goes through the Israelites as well, next thing you know, they're looking down there. David's standing there with Goliath's head. The Philistines are fleeing. All their armies pursuing after them. And they're sitting here going, who was that? Who, who was that? I, I thought he'd be bigger, you know. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. You know, David, he's, he's packing this around. He's like, hey, Eliab. You know, he had to have. He had to have. Hey, Eliab, come here. Let's see how big your head is next to his, you know. You think I'm not, he's still, I mean, I'm sure he didn't do that. David's a man of God. He's a man after God's own heart. He wasn't doing that. But I think he was probably hopping up and down a little bit. It had to be pretty exciting. The king said, inquire thou whose son the stripling is. See, they're still caught. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a runt. He's a, he's a little guy. He's just a kid. You know, who is this? And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So I, I love this story. The story is so important in the Bible. It's, it's, this, is, this is how God establishes his king in the eyes of the people. Um, it, it's how God shows that his man is better than the king that is standing there trembling in his boots with the rest of the army. His man is not trusting in God. I mean, his man is trusting in God, whereas... The, the former king that he has now rejected is not trusting in God. It shows the, the spiritual aspect of warfare that, that you've, you've got to understand that we all, all have got to, to engage in on a day by day, year by year, throughout our life basis. And, and it's just this. You cannot ride the coattails of your parents' faith. You've got to have a track record with God for yourself. How does that develop? Every day, walking with God. Every day, praising God the way David did. Read through the Psalms. Look, look what David did. Those Psalms are written out of a life of praise and worship. Going about chores. Going about chores. Okay? Uh, how hot has it been here lately? How would you like to be camped out at San Saba with 350 ewe lambs? for the summer. Wouldn't that be fun? Walking around all day long, and they, eh, 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 maybe graze, right? Eh, 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 eh. Every night, every single night, you get them all in, you get them bedded down, you get your, your fire going, you roll you out a burrito, right over the hill, there's a bunch of coyotes right over there. You're not, you don't sleep. You can't sleep. There's no sleep, right? Kids today, oh, would they whine? Can you imagine the whining that would take place if your dad walked in and said, I'm sending you to San Saba to take care of 300 head of ewe lambs for the summer. Oh, I can't do that. 
child abuse is what we would call that today. They called it a summer job, right? That's what David did. But in the midst of that, look what he learned. He learned how to worship God. He learned how to trust God. He learned how to, he learned how to be a warrior. He is not scared of the giant. Why? Because he's a big bad dude? No. Because he trusts God. And I just want to encourage you. You and I, we need to trust God in the same way. We need to learn to trust God as we walk day by day. He was fearless. He was trusting in the faithfulness of God. He was focused on his faith in God. And he fought for the glory of God and not for his own. Father, we love you and we thank you for the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. And God, we know that that we may, not, we may not actually face a nine, ten foot tall giant, but we're going to face giant sized problems in our life. And I pray, God, when we do, that we'll face them exactly the way that David did. That we'll be fearless and that we'll focus on your faithfulness and that we will just, just be so zeroed in on, on trusting in you and that we'll always fight for your glory that will fight the good fight of faith. Thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you for this church. I pray that you'll build and strengthen all of our faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. I love you. I'm glad you're here.